Matt Commonwealth versus James Keane. Commonwealth. Mr. Keating, on docket 1451 CR 1679, it is alleged that on October 15, 2014, you did operate a motor vehicle while under the influence of drugs, that you negligently operated that motor vehicle. And count three is that you operated a motor vehicle in, under the influence of drugs and operated that vehicle negligently, thereby causing serious bodily injury to another. The allegations took place in the city of Walton. Um, Mr. Keating, a plea of not guilty is entered on your behalf. Anytime you're in court, you're entitled to be represented by a lawyer. I'm going to ask Attorney Minton to be your lawyer in this uh, matter. It would be legal to be through his service. Carl, is there a question of bail? Yes, Your Honor. There's a question of bail, a question of conditions, and a motion to revoke. Thank you. Your Honor, before I begin, I will state that we previously filed a motion to revoke the defendant's bail on docket 1447 CR 263 out of the Concord District Court. I have some documentary evidence for the court's consideration with respect to that. The first is Waltham Police Report number 1402-6663, which is associated with the complaint before the court here. I have the motor vehicle crash report preliminarily associated with that same police report. A copy of the defendant's booking photo and booking sheet. A copy of two citations which the defendant has been served with. Copy of the defendant's license, image, and driving history. a copy of the docket sheet and police report 1447 CR 263. If I may be heard an argument. Sure. With beginning with what I believe has been marked as Commonwealth Exhibit 7, the Concord docket sheet as well as police report, it there is now probable cause to believe that the defendant has committed a new offense after having been released on conditions um, as well as bail and was advised of the potential bail revocation. On the face of that docket, it indicates that on February 26th of 2014, he was advised of his potential for bail revocation. The facts of that case come from a Lexington Police Department report and allege that on, I believe it was February 25th of 2014, Officers of the Suburban Middlesex County Drug Task Force were conducting surveillance on an ongoing narcotics investigation when they observed an individual um, believed to be the defendant in a passenger seat of a car operated by Mr. Chasen. <coughs> on that day at approximately 2.41, officers of the Middlesex County Drug Task Force observed the driver operating uh, registration 3BLR90 with the defendant as a passenger in the area of Lincoln Street in the town of Lexington. The detectives observed that vehicle meet up with another vehicle, both stopping in that same immediate vicinity. The detective reports observing Mr. Chasen exit his vehicle and approach the Hispanic male in the other vehicle, ultimately getting into the passenger seat of that vehicle. The detective reports observing a brief exchange between the two before Chasen returned to operate his vehicle with the defendant before you remaining in the passenger seat of Mr. Chasen's vehicle. Ultimately believing that a drug transaction had occurred, they conducted motor vehicle stops of both vehicles. <coughs> in encountering the individual in the other car, Mr. Flores, they observed a large wad of cash lying on his lap. 
The detective reports discovering a clear plastic sandwich bag containing 10 smaller clear plastic bags with what be was believed to be a heroin, as it was a brown powdery substance. Ultimately, another detective reported approaching the vehicle that the defendant was a passenger in with Mr. Chasen operating it. They observed the defendant attempting to conceal something with his right hand between the front driver's seat and the front passenger seat. The defendant did comply when asked to exit the vehicle, but continued moving his right hand as the detective reported at that point seeing two small clear plastic baggies containing a white powdery substance believed to be cocaine. They ultimately spoke with the operator of that vehicle, Mr. Chasen, who indicated <coughs> that he had in fact just purchased with the defendant six bags of heroin from Mr. Flores, paying $40 for each bag. In searching Mr. Chasen, they found six small clear plastic bags containing a brown powdery substance believed to be heroin and were cons packaged in a manner consistent with distribution of heroin. While speaking with Mr. Chasen, the detectives learned that, the de that Mr. Chasen had just discovered a clear plastic sandwich bag with numerous smaller plastic bags inside it containing a white powdery substance believed to be cocaine under the driver's seat where Mr. Chasen had been sitting and it was underneath the seat cover of that particular seat. They ultimately also found a counterfeit $100 bill and finally spoke with the defendant before you, Mr. Keating. <coughs> they, in speaking with Mr. Keating, learned that he did in fact meet with Mr. Flores to purchase heroin, but he maintained that they were given the cocaine by accident. Mr. Keating confirmed that the two bags had come from the larger bag, the, the two bags that were found on him had come from the larger bag that was recovered from under Mr. Chasen's seat. Ultimately, in weighing the bags, Detective Lord discovered that were found on Mr. Flores, they were found to be 12.7 grams on Mr. Flores, and in excess, I believe it was 18.1 grams in total of the cocaine found between Mr. Chasen, Mr. Keating, and Mr. Flores. The defendant was originally charged with trafficking cocaine out of the Concord District Court, as well as possession to distribute a Class A substance, heroin, and conspiracy to violate the drug law. That was amended in March of, of 2014. I'd suggest that now there is probable cause to believe that the defendant has committed a new offense, specifically that before the court of operating under the influence of drugs, negligent operation, operating under the influence of drugs, resulting in serious bodily injury, for which he's before the court today and that he does present a heightened danger, obviously, to the community, given the facts of this case. Those coming from what has been marked as Commonwealth's Exhibit 1 for purposes of the motion come from a Waltham police report and allege that on October 15th of 2014, at approximately 11.10 in the morning, officers of the Waltham Police Department responded to 264 Street in the vicinity of Rosewood Drive for a report of a motor vehicle accident involving a pedestrian. Upon arrival on the scene, they found an 82-year-old man lying unconscious on the sidewalk adjacent to the northbound side of Forest Street. He had obvious and serious injuries to his facial area and was quickly medified to Boston Medical Center. He was ultimately, later that day, pronounced dead there due to his injuries from this accident. In investigating the crash and with Waltham Reconstruction Team in responding, they learned that in speaking with the defendant that he may be impaired from drugs at the time of the crash, he admitted that he had taken prescription medications earlier in the day. He appeared drowsy and seemed to nod off in the middle of a sentence. Ultimately, a drug recognition expert was requested on scene and did respond. They also spoke with witnesses on, with a witness to the accident who stated that prior to the collision, he had been traveling north on Linden Street when he turned left onto Beaver Street pulling behind the vehicle the defendant was operating. At that time, he saw the defendant's vehicle cross the double yellow dividing lines completely into the, le into the eastbound lane on two occasions when it finally turned onto Forest Street. The witness relayed that the defendant's vehicle proceeding north on Forest Street at approximately 20 miles per hour was swerving about the wide northbound lane of Forest Street. The witness at one point stated that the defendant's vehicle moved to the far right of the northbound lane and that he attempted to pass him. He stated that as he neared the defendant's vehicle, 
the left rear corner, he saw a pedestrian propelled into the air and above the defendant's vehicle's roof. The witness stated that he saw the pedestrian land off to the right of the roadway, and he was found by officers approximately eight feet off the roadway against a fence. Following the impact, the defendant continued to drive northerly until, ultimately, the witness's vehicle was able to pull in front of him, coming to a stop. The defendant's vehicle only came to a stop when it bumped the rear of the van, which was a mass pupil plate, um, mass pupil van. <coughs> In speaking with the defendant, officers learned that he had proceeded up Beaver Street, but he stated he did not recall having ever turned onto Forest Street, although that was taking him away from the easiest route home, in which he reported that he was driving home at the time this occurred. He stated that all of a sudden his, he was driving along when his windshield was mass, smashed in, and he stated that he had thought he had hit a tree or a pole, but was advised that he had hit a person. He appeared drowsy, his eyes were at half-mast, they observed him on several occasions to completely close his eyes, nod off, lean back, and sway. His speech was thick-tongued at times, his pupils appeared to be normal in size, but he did admit to taking his prescription medication, Alpramazon, also known as Xanax, and Citalprom, which is also known as a depression medication. He further stated that he, in the past, had used heroin, um, but denied using in the recent months. They conducted field sobriety tests as well as a, um, ultimately, other what are known as drug recognition tests. Police observed the defendant's vehicle to have extensive damage to the windshield area in the front on the passenger side, consistent with a body impacting the windshield, and they observed hair and tissue embedded in the glass. They also recovered from the defendant's car, a prescription for Alpramazon, which had been filled on October 14th of 2014 and contained 60 pills. The prescription called for one pill to be taken twice daily with three pills to be taken, which would have equated to three pills to be taken at the point at which they recovered the bottle, leaving 57 pills left. However, when officers inventoried that pill bottle, they only found 38 pills in the bottle at the time of the inventory. In looking at the defendant's booking photo, which is submitted in Commonwealth Exhibit 3, you can clearly see that the defendant's eyes are essentially closed in the photograph. The citations indicate the same charges here, substantiating further probable cause for the offense. The Commonwealth is requesting, in addition to the motion to revoke, $50,000 cash bail, conditions of no drugs, random screens, and no driving should he make that bail. Given the serious nature of the charges, as well as the fact that the Commonwealth is further investigating additional charges, and that there is a mandatory minimum associated with charge three, it suggests that that is the appropriate amount of bail, and the defendant posing a serious danger should be revoked. With respect to the matter in Congress, uh, that happened some time ago, most serious charges have been uh, reduced. Uh, clearly from the police report, my client is not the primary suspect in that case. Indeed, uh, it appears that uh, he's the less culpable of anyone and will most likely be found guilty of anything of possession. And at that time, uh, he indicated to the police the other day that uh, he had a heroin problem, that uh, he hasn't done heroin in nine months, uh, that dates back to the date of this particular arrest in Congress. Uh, he indicates that uh, uh, indeed he, he had a problem and that was uh, he was a buyer there. Uh, that case will likely be resolved uh, with probation and some sort of testing. Uh, I don't. I suggest that the uh, court not revoke his bail on that particular case. Um, as we go on to this case uh, in Waltham the other day. Um, there's certainly uh, a very different side of the story that uh, has yet to be told. Um, my client, uh, if anything, was stunned uh, by the uh, incident that was caused uh, when his car struck uh, this elderly gentleman uh, and is devastated uh, by the fact that the, uh, that individual has passed away. Uh, my client indicates, and there's evidence that will show, uh, that within a half hour thereabouts before the accident, he was indeed at Planet Fitness. 
and he was there working out. Uh, he tells me that he spent over half an hour on the treadmill, uh, and that he did some weights, drank some water, uh, and when he indicated that he took his medication, uh, he tells me that when he takes his medication, he takes less if it was prescribed or not. When I confronted him about the missing pills, he said there are no missing pills. He said that uh, he spends most of his time with his mom. He recently went through a divorce uh, and, had, and spends uh, the other half of his time uh, with his brothers in, in, in different areas. And what he does when he gets his prescription, which was just filled the day before, uh, he separates them, not counting the pills, but just separates them into what he considers half and half. And if he says, if the police look in the back of the motor vehicle that he was driving, uh, in a blue bottle, they'll find the balance of the pills that they're alleging are, are missing. Um, my client indicates that he was coming from the workout, he was going to an area that uh, many consider a school zone, he was going across 20 miles an hour, and it was a uh, school bus or a van that was uh, on his bumper. And uh, he was pulling over to let it by and, and turned onto Car Street. The bus continued to follow him, and the bus started to make a pass. It's a single lane, but it's a wide street. Uh, he says as he drifted over and looked in his rearview mirror and saw this van coming up on the outside passing, where I suggest it's um, questionable whether passing is legal in that area, he said his attention was drawn to his mirror and to this bus passing him. And that's when he struck this individual thinking it might have been a trash can or something else. And uh, that he wasn't trying to pull away. The van was next to him. He pulled up and the van pulled up in front of him. Uh, and they stopped. Uh, and when he realized what happened, he said he was just devastated. He didn't want to talk about the, what happened to the police. He was as open as he can. He told the police that he hasn't had heroin in nine months. And I count back uh, to the convict case. And that's uh, there about nine months. Uh, I, uh, one of the issues was that uh, there was a drug recognition expert came uh, to Waltham and they uh, did a test on my client. Um, however, nowhere in the discovery uh, do I have his report. It's indicated to me that, oh well, he's from Cambridge. You know, he will do his report later in Cambridge. Um, and here we are talking about a pretty serious matter and uh, this, this drug recognition work doesn't need uh, any particular mechanical, mechanical devices to put his findings together. Uh, we sat down in, in Waltham and put together a report that had it here. Uh, I suggest that uh, something isn't right with this uh, drug recognition expert, and uh, we should have his, uh, his findings here today. Uh, my client uh, recently uh, went through a divorce, that's why he's done uh, some medication. He tells me that he does not take the medications in full, but he has a uh, pill cutter that is also in his car. It takes less than the, uh, the amount uh, that is uh, prescribed to him. Uh, he tells me that uh, he is single, has no children. He graduated from Waltham High School in 1999 where he played baseball and wrestled. Uh, he was a short-term uh, student at uh, the Art Institute in Boston. Uh, and since his divorce, he's been uh, having some difficult times working construction and uh, he was getting his feet back on the ground. He was just devastated the other day when this happened. Uh, I'd ask the court not to revoke his bail. Uh, I'm sure that the police have issued an uh, immediate threat to the registry of my client who likely to lose his license uh, for the pendency of this case. Uh, I, I believe when the full evidence comes out, we expect where he came from, uh, where these missing pills are, I think this case is going to take a different complexion and that uh, my client would be in uh, better footing to defend himself. Nonetheless, today I asked the court to, uh, uh, not to put a restrictive bail on my client, uh, to put a bail that perhaps his family could try to make, and, um, and my client is, is, uh, would show up for every case, uh, every date that uh, this court sets. The ninth case.
illustrated for 1022, October 27th. And Bill sent me about fifty thousand dollars of cash. We remain that bill the condition of no use of substances. And I have one more motion for the court's consideration. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you. 